Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Hearthstone Championship Tour, America's Winter Preliminary. I'm TJ, and throughout the day, I'll be joining Frodan and giving you guys match updates from the uh, matches that are happening off stream, uh, checking in with some of the fireside gatherings that are happening across the Americas, and of course, providing you with some player interviews uh, from some of the players that are competing here at the Winter Preliminary. Uh, we have an exciting weekend full of matches, and I know I'm personally excited to see how it's going to play out. In Europe, we saw uh, a lot of unknown players make it through and, and make it to that top eight uh, to make it to that European championship. Uh, so we'll see if North America uh, has what it takes. Uh, make sure throughout the day you guys are staying engaged on social media. Uh, you can head over to facebook.com slash Hearthstone, or uh, you can tweet at Play Hearthstone using the hashtag HCT. Uh, throughout the day, we will be featuring tweets on stream. So if you have some next level Reddit analysis, or if you uh, want to let us know who you're rooting for or what players you would like to see advance, uh, head on over there and you'll have a chance to have your tweet featured uh, on the stream. But uh, we're about to jump into the next matchup. So we have Dan, Raven, and Kevin on the desk ready with the play-by-play. Thank you very much, TJ, and greetings from the casting desk. That's right. If you hashtag HCT, you can join the conversation. Let us know uh, what's going on, some of your favorite moments. And I do believe that there is an extra 50% chance that you can increase your odds of being featured if you write it in a haiku format. Raven, can you confirm that? Yeah, that's definitely right. Okay. 100%. I was just throwing it out there because uh, poetry and randomness in tandem is very fun. Of course. Yeah. What has to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, uh, people are very familiar with Raven. If you've watched DreamHack, you've watched the Gfinity series. But uh, we have a newcomer on the desk who is joining us. It is Kevin. Uh, can you go ahead and, and introduce yourself to anybody watching uh, on stream right now? For sure, Dan, and thanks very much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be mm -hmm. here. I'm really excited about kind of what's going down this weekend. So for those of you who don't know me, my background, I'm a gaming journalist, esports analyst, podcast host, known and loved by dozens. Mm -hmm. And it's, Millions, uh, even. <laughs> potentially. I'm modest. But it's, they, they don't know yet. They don't know yet, Kevin. But, but the, they will. The, the billions out there. That's yeah, right. so the show's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be a really great time. We have some really exciting matches coming up today, and I'm really looking forward to it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, Kevin is one of the members that has entered the competition that Blizzard sent out a while ago where they want to, you know, f get the community involved, get some of the people that the voices that aren't heard as often. So you saw Cora earlier. She was joining Robert and uh, Brian Kibler, and this weekend we're joined by Kevin. Uh, last weekend we also had Saul, a good there friend go. of Raven, <laughs> as well as uh, Aquablad. I love those guys. I uh, also give a shout out to D2. So and not only is it the players that are new, these are also some voices. So make sure, you know, go ahead, tell, talk to Kevin online. I'm sure that you really want to engage with some people and uh, get to know them a little bit better because we're going to be comfy here for two days. Uh, what are you most excited about, Kevin, coming into the winter prelims? I mean, I think the, the thing about the entirety of the Hearthstone Championship Tour that most interests me now is the fact that we get to see so many great new faces, right? We have the opportunity now, with the way that the whole tournament structure throughout this year works now, to really engage with a whole new level of player that we haven't really seen before. We've got known players, pros who are really very familiar with how things are going, and in general, I think it's really awesome, but I do want to see some new players succeed. I think we will. I think we definitely will have some of the new people rise up. It already has happened to a large degree. Uh, Raven, let's talk about something else as well. Is there anything you're looking forward to? Are there any uh, players, both known and unknown, at least to the public, that you're take, you're keeping an eye on for this event? Uh, yeah, for me as well. Like first time being uh, being in America, so that's going to be a lot of fun and learn about all the new players that you guys know. Oh, welcome. Uh, yeah, fun. thanks, man. Yeah, um, who know quite a lot about. But I'm uh, I'm actually looking forward to seeing that uh, admirable play actually. So I've cast with him before. Oh, so and he's actually yeah. uh, been putting a lot yeah. of work into uh, into his tournament prep. He's actually said he's never been more prepared for a tournament ever. And uh, just kind of interesting to see how he performs and just the overall. Just seeing these new players come up in the tournament, as you said, was he's going to be really interesting and kind of see how it happens like versus what happened last weekend in the uh, the EU prelim. Yeah, that's right. For anybody who doesn't uh, who hasn't had the opportunity to catch up with the European preliminaries, what happened was basically every player that we know and love, and I'm talking about Kalento, Oskaka, Tice, and some of the most franchise players in all of competitive Hearthstone, uh, they lost. They didn't qualify for the event. Some went very far. I think uh, Sho from Team Liquid went pretty deep. 6-0 from Team Navi also went very deep. Uh, however, they were just only a couple of rounds away. We take the top eight to advance to the Winter Championships. 
where only one player can get a guaranteed spot for BlizzCon. However, ultimately qualifying for the event does give you some money. We have $100,000 in prizes, as well as some points to give away and distribute throughout the events. Uh, and the reason why is because at the very end of the year, we give away three spots to three winners of the seasons, followed by a last call from however many points accrued throughout the year. Yeah, it's definitely a huge opportunity for all the players overall. You've got the uh, sort of known pros who obviously want to go to the uh, the championships at the end of the year, which is going to be huge. But also all these lesser known players actually mm -hmm. on top of, you know, earning the money is going to be pretty nice. But really just the breakout performance and getting more known because it's something that uh, a lot of newer players have struggled to do. Uh, these guys are obviously really good at the game and very high skilled. But actually just getting the name out there in a tournament mm -hmm. like this is going to be massive for them just in terms of popularity. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned Admirable. I'm just going to throw out, uh, you know, a couple names as well. I'm looking forward to see if Frozen can really live up to some of the hype. Uh, I actually did want to pick Fibonacci as well, just because I'm a big fan of his control style of play. Uh, he's a guy that's very much like Tice, like Life Coach. Even if the aggro or the meta is extremely biased towards aggro, they will bring control decks and try to thwart those plans. Uh, so I want to hop it over to Kevin as well. Is there any players that we haven't matched and already? I, I imagine we already struck into your list a little bit and dipped there. Uh, but is there any players that you're looking out for? I mean, there's there's a ton of players that I'm really excited to see play this weekend. Uh, obviously, there are some established pros like Strife Crow, who I think is going to have a really great run this weekend. But there's definitely some unknowns. Uh, one person in particular I did want to call out is Chess Dude, who is the only player tournament-wide who has brought an entirely unique set of four classes. He's the only person with a totally unique roster in this tournament. So he is playing... I'm going to just make a prediction. So he's going to play a Priest... Shaman, I don't know, are there two <laughs> class? Hunter? Is he going to bring a hunter? Are we going to see a hunter class? I hope we learn that. That would be fascinating yeah. to me, Raven. Yeah. I mean, you you probably know as well. I do, but I know okay. we're going to just kind of let him. Right, Hopefully, right, we're going right. to see it on the stream later. That's I'm what just I'm making hoping. some predictions because there's only nine classes. There's only so many permutations, but that will be a player I keep an eye out for. In the meantime, guys, our first match that we're going to talk about here is Chalky versus Crumtastic, a player that we've very been we've been familiar with many times over as Chalky. We've seen him qualify for many events. We've seen him make really deep runs in tournaments, and yet he's still looking for that ever elusive championship crown. But will this be his time? Yeah, I think it's something he's definitely after. I mean, again, as you said, a super well-known player, pretty much been in the scene from the beginning. But although performing well overall and consistently, never quite got all the way to the end to get that big win. So he's definitely going to be hungry for it. Yeah, I think this is a really great opportunity for Chalky since he's never really had that final, really impressive finish to really show up and tell us what he can do. He's brought a really unique set of decks here. I am a little disappointed, I'm not going to lie, that he's had his Shaman list banned out. It could be a strong indication of respect. I think Chalky is touted as one of the strongest aggro players. And when people look at aggro decks, they are unfairly pegged as brainless or not really like thoughtful and complex. But there are a lot of impactful decision making uh, that's made in the very early stages of the game that people don't really attribute a lot of uh, skill immediately with. But when they start playing with a lot at the highest level, I mean, we've seen it even recently as a couple days ago. That aggro shot can be very complicated to play. Play, and I know it's one of Chalky's favorite. He was one of the first people to play Agro Shaman back in the days when Hearthstone was still in the beta phase and not even fully released yet. Without that tunnel truck. Without the Crazy. tunnel truck. Which has absolutely <laughs> bolstered its power significantly in recent times. Yeah, it's hard to imagine playing Agro Shaman without Tunnel Drug anymore, but it is uh, it is a list that's seen a lot of success, actually. Even last weekend in the EU, and again, I think we're going to see it really shine through this weekend as well. Okay, well, game number one I is underway. Keep in mind, again, these players are at different firesides around the nation as well as the different regions. But we do have two American players. Welcome. That, that air you, by the way, that you breathe is completely free. <laughs> Thanks a lot so for that. Just, I hope just you enjoy confirming that, Raven. I made eye contact with him <laughs> as I said it so he can really that, understand. That did get intense. That did get intense, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> All right, well, uh, it's going to be Hunter versus Paladin. Already uh, an interesting dynamic because we don't see Hunter that often, which is very weird to say. About a year and a half ago, Hunter was one of the most common classes that you'll ever see. Uh, these days, why don't we see it, Raven? I think mainly because in the sort of expansions that have come out in the past few months that the Hunter class hasn't really gained anything that's super impactful. Whereas, you know, we look on the other side of Paladin and a card like Mysterious Challenger, which, you know, pretty much created its own deck. So, the, but the Hunter pick here is actually pretty good. And I think Fantastic's going to be quite happy with the lineup against the Paladin, because overall Hunter does perform quite well. And it's one of the reasons why I think this class is going to be taken to a tournament like this. 
I do actually think that there is an opportunity here for Hunter to kind of sneak up the middle and surprise people. Because people, honestly, it's it's very much the same as how Agro Shaman really blew up and burst onto the scene. People had forgotten how to play against it, right? So as the Paladin player, you have to now think about some stuff that hasn't been relevant in the meta for a long time. Do I play around Unleash, right? There's all these variables that were very common a year ago, but now people have to kind of re-engage that part of their brain and think very critically about what it is that they I might be seeing. It does feel like if there's one player who would be in tune with those kinds of decisions, whether deck building or play styles, it would be Chalky. Uh, a self-proclaimed, unabashed, a bonafide hunter player, right? He's one of those players uh, very much... I, I, I can imagine that's why him and Robert Wing get along so well, because their <laughs> love for Rexar and the face. But, um, it, you know, it goes without saying, Chalky is definitely one of the strongest hunter players as well. So I agree a lot with what you're saying, Kevin. Uh, however, I don't think Chalky would be a player to be surprised by it. Yeah, I think having that level of experience, and even some of his teammates are actually known, like Green Cheap, for example, is known to be a, like a very aggressive hunter player as well. Sure. So definitely learn a lot there. And Chalky's one of those players that actually identifies the meta and tries to take picks, you know, make his lineup do well against what the meta's doing at the moment, as opposed to just going with super standard decks overall and just hoping it gets through that. Way. I do feel a little bad for Chalky here because he does have obviously a couple of options this turn, but in general, this was not a really strong opening for Secret Paladin, which traditionally is very successful by virtue of having that really, really well curved out early game. So to be put in this position where he doesn't have really strong board presence, really obvious lines of play in the next couple of turns here, it could be that he's actually going to get punished, especially by Hunter. Well, Hunter has almost all the damage that they want to directly deal, and this Hunter specifically is extremely aggressive. You even have Leroy Jenkins, another card that's often debated whether or not you put it in the uh, the, the Hunter lists. Uh, therefore, you know, because it's really aggressive, can it outpace the Paladin? So far, it's doing a pretty good job of it. However, I'm looking at cards like that Coghammer. That Coghammer still can allow you to push a lot of damage and stop the damage that the weapon would be doing. And if you only have the, the hero power and the kill command to get through, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah, I think it was really interesting as well that the Repentance normally sounds bad when it happens on a two yeah, health minion, true. but against a juggler when you have Buster to follow up with and actually just kill it off with the weapons, pretty huge. Because one of the big swing turns a hunter can do in general against Paladin is to just say juggler unleash, and it just takes out so many of the tokens it actually generates, so it's really swing, but Crumtastic is actually doing really well here, and like you said about the Leroy throwdown, I think one of the good things is because Leroy isn't super common, it's take as like a surprise pick where it's like, oh yeah, they can just burst for six out of nowhere. I mean, the Coghammer does represent a really good way for Chalky to protect himself, but with what we're seeing right now available to Chromtastic, he's actually going to be able to push a lot of damage, and there's not traditionally going to be much in the way of healing in a Secret Paladin deck. Unless he's teched very specifically for this, he's actually going to be quite vulnerable to the Hunter Hero Power, and he doesn't have sufficient board presence yet to actually end the game in any significant fashion. It's going to take him time to build that board up the way that he really wants to. Yeah, and so this play, this turn, he had two different lines of play he could have taken. He could have used the weapon to start getting the charges out. One of the arguments you can make is without those weapon charges out, they're not actual guaranteed damage. So you look at cards like Coghammer, it's like six damage, but you need three turns to do it. However, you're also giving time for your opponent to play spells like Kill Command, if they have it, or Animal Companion, or Unleash the Hounds. This is something that Chalky is very afraid of. So he plays the Lotheb, which does expose him to a play that I think Kumtatsuk was going to make anyways, without Lotheb or not. Yeah, the, the bow and Terra power just feels really good here anyway, as you said, without Lotheb. And the fact that he's just going to Arcane Golem as well. I mean, he has all the first oh, next turn. He can probably just actually end the game, um, especially with the second bow here, unless the Coghammer comes out onto, say, the Lotheb and makes it a little bit more awkward to deal with. Yeah, there was definitely a risk there, and I huh. think Chalky definitely held back on the Coghammer because he doesn't necessarily want that Taunt and Divine Shield on a 1-1 token. But this is a this is a complicated position to be in, and I don't know if you're the Paladin player here. Like, Challenger on 6 is a very obvious play, but do you choose the safe play here and use that Coghammer right now? But yeah, well, yeah. I think if he doesn't, it's actually just going to be game. So it's one of the tough ones where you have to just make that call, and it's really difficult to make the more greedier sort of play, which sounds weird to play Mysterious Challenger as, as a greedy option, but if there's something Hunter can draw, it's definitely burst. And when the Hunter's already mm. got three cards in hand, is you know, the odds on having that burst damage yet, whether in the form of like quick shot or as we can see Arcane Golem or Kill Command, like running on seven health is kind of scary. Quickly. 
Yeah, I think about it in terms of uh, something we've talked about with Brian Kibler wow. a fair bit, where you actually want to put threats on the board here and push damage, because honestly, it's not like he can recover. Chalky's dead in two turns here pretty much either way. Yeah, exactly. And what he's doing now is just setting up where, okay, you know, I, I could potentially die here, but um, but if I don't, you know, like, I win Whoa. next turn. But that is double kill command, which is still <laughs> not, gonna still not enough. enough. Yeah, It's not enough, and he's one damage off. However, there is a way to potentially swing back the board. And we always talk <laughs> about this because of the Pilot Shredder. But even that's annoying! The Pilot Shredder's a Divine Shield! If this, it couldn't get any more awkward for Crumtastic. He has to spend a lot in order to potentially survive, and that is a very unlikely scenario. No, ultimately, I think he's, he's looking at this and he's going to make that play just to see if he can make it one more turn. But if he takes the four damage from the Pilot of Treader to clear mm -hmm. it, he's going to be left at four health with his opponent having a weapon equipped. Yeah. I don't think he's in a position to come back here. Yeah, I think he would probably go with the play of double kill command just to save it, save the damage. Yes. I mean, it, uh, to a certain extent, it doesn't matter because next turn he can just Leroy Hero Power and then that's going to be enough as long as another taunt doesn't come down. So he does have options, but double kill command feels the safest. But in all honesty, at this point, you're relying on like Doomsday from Shredder. So what? What's so interesting too is Chalky had a chance of still losing if the taunt landed on the one one. He would be able to use the weapon, the kill command, and the arcane golem. So you know, it's one of those scenarios where there was a, there was a chance for Kumtat to take it. And another icing on the cake. We have the taunt come out of the pilot Shredder. This is not your game, Kumtat. You tried. The Wait, hunter's ultimate enemy, that taunt minion. Yeah. I, I heard Taunt is cheating, but uh, we'll let this one slide, Chucky. It's okay. Uh, you know what's really interesting, too, is that this is the, the game and the matchup that I think the Hunter wanted. I think Hunter generally wants to catch this kind of Paladin and outpace it early on, but that opening hand when you draw the most expensive card in your deck in Leroy Jenkins and you get more situational like game-ending damage instead of board-building cards... Uh, I think that's what ultimately caused Crumtastic's demise here. Yeah, just a lack of the earlier minions, because it, it plays in a sort of similar way to the way like Aggro Shaman plays, where you use the minions early to get damage and then finish them with burst later on. So it, it just having that Leroy and then the, even like having the kill command relatively early doesn't really do too much. You normally want to do that to either remove a minion out of the way or actually just finish the game. So that was kind of kind of rough. It was close still. He was mm -hmm. only uh, one off anyway, so pretty close game. But as you said, that was the matchup he actually wanted, and now he's going to have to work out how he's hunted is actually going to do against the other line from, che uh, from Checky. Right, and he was stuck in kind of a tough position there where he saw both kill commands and never saw a beast in his hunter deck, which is a really rough place to be. So, I mean, mm -hmm. out of what's left of Chalky's lineup, I don't know that there's anything in there that this hunter deck is going to be really strong against. He's going to be in a really tough place to try and get a win with that deck now. Well, I look at the lineup, and I do think there is one opening. The Warlock deck still can be very vulnerable to the Hunter deck. And the reason why I say this is because I'm just predicting that Chalky is bringing uh, a Zoo Warlock, a uh, very board-centric, uh, vulnerable to explosive traps, still very vulnerable to Unleashed Hounds, and ultimately the hero powers still work against it. Um, traditionally, the Hunter is very strong against it. So uh, I, maybe it is. However, I mean, Zoos today, these days are still refining their list. They're no longer playing cards and that are slow like Dr. Boom and Malganus as frequently. Uh, do you have any read on this matchup specifically, Raven? Yeah, um, I, I agree. I think Zoo has certain cards that can really swing the game. So, yeah, Argus on its own, but also if you get, like, Bran Argus down, then sometimes the walls are just nice. too big for the Hunter to deal with, because probably run, like, one, two owls, maybe. But even just, you're spending resources getting through two taunt minions that aren't huge, but big enough not to be able to remove and really slow it down. And then a card like Unleash the Hounds is going to be important, because the way the Zoo wins, they don't really have run any real removal, but they just win through board presence and then Unleash can swing that really hard, especially if there's like turn five knife trigger or something like that. Yeah, I don't think as the hunter in this position you want to be left in a place where you're forced to trade at all. You want to go straight face, you want to do as much damage as possible, attempt to close the game out before you see the defender of Argus come down at all, because that's really the best opportunity he's got. Yeah, I think a lot of that's reliant on traps as well. We didn't actually see any of the traps come out. Uh, from the hunter That's list, true. so no, no there's a mixture of if you run double explosive trap or you know aggro hunters running freeze trap, and maybe even a snake as well. So there's a lot of uh, variance on how that affects the zoo matchup. It does, and something to consider too is that you're not just trying to win one or even two or three series. You know, some of these tournaments that you watch in Hearthstone, they might have eight or sixteen players. You can account for different choices. Uh, for that specific pool, that makes sense. But if you're playing against 100 plus players, you really have to think long term. So if 
I have a diversity of secrets, it makes it harder for people to play around as more information gets passed. Because now that Crumtastic is playing Hunter, and specifically the aggressive Hunter, everyone who plays against him from this point on will be on notice. Yeah, exactly, and just be fully prepared for it. And we see that a lot with decks like uh, Warlock and Mage, where there's multiple powerful archetypes, but that really affect your mulligans, actually. So that's a big part of the opening. Just just mulliganing for the right archetype is super important in the matchup. So having that knowledge already, even now for Chaki, like, it could have been mid-range Hunter, but now Chaki knows he's fully prepared for, for what's going to come out there. And we do see a trap. Okay. We see a bear trap in this Hunter vs. Warlock, which ends up being the matchup we were discussing. Kevin, do you have any opinions on bear trap? I actually really like bear trap here. I think it does give him, I mean, A, a beast, B, the biggest body that he can get on the board in the early game. So it is significant in that respect. Ultimately, I don't know if it's going to be enough. I am interested to see that Chalky, in his mulligan, did actually throw away the Defender of Argus, which was the card that we sort of had indicated earlier, does have one of the most significant effects on how this match is going to play out. Yeah, I think a lot has to do with his opening hand not having anything to do on turn one. And against Hunter, a bad matchup, that feels like a death sentence because if their opponent plays a turn one play, then you're forever reacting to what he's doing. And therefore, he's going to be able to hit aggressively and you have to trade. Yeah, I think at the very least, you need to go like toe to toe straight away and especially going first, as you said. Makes you want sense. something on the board straight, uh, initially. And Chaki, just an interesting card coming up there is the Sea Giant. Um, there's a few variants on the zoo list, some actually just curve out at five, and some do run the sea giant. And a lot of it is actually just a call on the meta, because if you're expecting a lot of zoo, then the sea giant can actually just win that mirror. Because sure. both, uh, you're both trying to build the board up, makes the sea giant so much cheaper, so you can just drop it on the board really early. And the same is going to be said for the hunter, actually. Yeah, I do think that ultimately right now, I like the position Crumtastic is in, where he's able to trade his leper gnome into that flame imp. He's going to be able to put his opponent at a low health point, there's a lot of damage represented on this board, and in general, the the fact that Chalky's really going to try to race Crumtastic does represent a risk. He is taking some real risks in how he's going to approach this matchup. He doesn't have a really, really great way to answer what he's going to see out of the Hunter right now. The Bear Trap play is very fascinating because there's so many ways this could be interpreted. The first is that Crumtastic played the minion and traded into the wolf. Therefore, you're inclined to believe this is a freezing trap. You isolate a target that you don't want to hit. And Flame Imp is also one of the hardest to play again because you keep doing damage to yourself. Yep. So it's interpreted as freezing trap. But I think either way, Chalky would end up attacking uh, with this Flame Imp. So it ends up being this thing where maybe it doesn't pay off for Crumtastic as much as he thinks he would. Yeah, I think the um, the benefit, you're completely right as well, because you can't really afford just not to attack, right? Because mm -hmm. it's just, you know, you need to do something. Or the Hunter will just win the race. But also the good thing now about leaving one minion up in the Bear Trap is that if the Flame Imp attacks face, the Bear Trap procs, and then there's no realistic removal for that bear. So oh, then you gain the three damage yeah. from the bear trap. Okay. So it's just pushing additional damage really quickly. And it's a taunt. So, yeah. you know, he's actually getting so much benefit by not leaving a minion then to just trade away. Yeah. And testing, testing face is absolutely correct there because you're going to see, is this a freezing trap? Is it an explosive trap? Is it a snake trap? Like, if he goes up and hits the minion, he doesn't get the same amount of information. So either way, he pretty much had to attack face there. Yeah, excellent point there, Kevin. And I think... It definitely has thrown a big wrench into things. You know, unfortunately for Comtastic, he couldn't sequence it in the way that he would want to get full value off the weapon. But look at that draw, Defender of Argus. Uh, interesting choice here, because Chalky can get half of its value, but still command the board in a very strong fashion, um, which would conveniently lean up so to an explosive trap. So there's a lot of dynamics and and small little tension here going on. Yeah, and speaking of the explosive trap, this is something I really like uh, to, to do in Hunter, is when you just run multiples, because a lot of Hunter lists are uh, very generally like double freezing, double explosive, and, and you're like, that's it. Whereas when you start going like one bear, one explosive, and maybe even one freezing is something you've seen in some Hunter lists, but it's just one of each, it really throws your opponent off, because now chucky has got to be thinking, okay, if he's running bear, is that something to be said for potentially running snake trap? Is, right. it, is it a freezing? Because freezing trap's just good. You know, there's so many things to think about, but he, luckily for Chucky, he does have that 1-1 one, one to actually test for something like freezing. It's something he would really like to just throw away. It does feel bad, though, for Crumtastic in the sense that he's left having had to play both of these traps from hand. No ability to put them on the board and get the value from, example, a mad scientist. That, that does hurt him a little bit. It does feel like the pace that he wanted to set in this game, he really hasn't been able to as of yet. I think it's okay as long as he doesn't pick the Mad Scientist up, because then they're just empty vessels. Yep. 
you know, there's nothing to really for them to pick up whatsoever from the deck. And also something to bear in mind, the two mana is still two damage. So it's going to actually clear off the Imgang boss potentially. Mm -hmm. But uh, look at the health. Like, Jackie's on 13, and, you know, Zulok isn't one known for its healing capabilities. So, you know, there's a point now where Jackie has to seriously think about, do you know, I have to try and win this game. And we can see that now from the power overwhelming on the gang boss to guarantee, like, a, at least a big hit and try and catch up on that damage. Because otherwise, just the bow, the hero power, and then the, you know, potential of multiple chances of burn coming out of the hunter. Yeah, I don't really know that if you were if you were Chalky in that position, you had any other choice. You just need to start an advanced damage and try to race your opponent on some level. Now, Crumtastic's left in a position where, as he looks at this board, he's staring down six damage just from what's on the board, not clear on what's behind it. We know that there's a power overwhelming in Chalky's hand, and that does mean that there's the ability for a lot of damage to come out. That Dark Peddler could draw another one, and that would be the game. So Crumtastic, as much as he wants to just push damage here, has to be a little bit wary of what his opponent is capable of doing right now. Yeah, and I think from this Animal Companion as well, he might even be just, like, happy with Misha. Like, normally you just think Face Hunter, Hoffa, right? That's all you want. But uh, with, like, if Misha came out of the Animal Companion, you can still Hero Power and use his bow, and you would hope that that's enough to delay the game one more turn, and then he has, like, I can go and kill Command, and the second charge of bow is managed to stack up. Oh, that's really too bad. The Leoc, I think, probably the only minion he didn't want to see out of that Animal Companion. So now, do you kill the Knife Juggler here? It's a tough one. I think you go phase because you just set up. You, you, I mean, look, you, you have Kill Command in hand, you have the Bow Charge, you have Arcane Gorm as well. So you're just setting up the point where if he finishes the game now, you know, he needs quite, you know, he needs quite a demanding amount of cards there. Whereas otherwise, the Hunter can just end the game pretty clearly next turn. There's a couple of cards that really stick out from the Dark Peddler possibilities. The first is Power Blow. I mean, the second is Soul Fire. And then there's also cards like Void Walker, and even like Gold Sheriff Open, to be honest. Like all those things, all those little small things do help. But the big problem is, can he survive oh, long oh, enough? It's a second power oh, That's lethal, right? That is, that is lethal. And the juggle to the now face, it's just, to, uh, just to make it a little bit worse from there. So wow, I mean, <laughs> and, and this is this yeah. is exactly what you talk about, Frodo, in the aggro matchups. Like, it actually comes down to little oh, things man. in terms of, like, charging in with that powerful army on the gang boss to push for that extra damage, because he knows he can't defend against the face hunter long enough. Yes. And you know what? You, you can say that Chucky was very fortunate in that spot, but class cards are four times as likely to appear than normal neutral cards. Therefore, it's stronger likelihood that you get some cool one-mana cards. And there's only a handful of them in Warlock. There's the Reliquary Seeker, there's the Voidwalker, the Flame Imp, uh, the Corruption. But we're looking at Soulfire and Power as yeah. two cards that you'll commonly see. Yeah, they're the ones you really want, especially in Zoo, because its ability to trade up is the real strength of the deck. And um, you know, the second you get Power Volume, even an Abusive Sergeant as well, is really good, uh, although it is a neutral card. Yeah, I felt bad. You can see from the look on Crumtastic's face, like when you <sighs> saw that create by Dark Peddler on the screen, yeah. he's just, oh, he was not happy with that outcome. I mean, I think you're less happy. I think you're, f first of all, you're definitely unhappy. Let's just establish yeah, that. That's, 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 we know that. We know if you're that. Crumtastic, life is pretty Crumtastic <laughs> right now. But uh, the, the thing that you think is like, wow, not only did he draw a uh, power of overwhelming, which is well, somewhat reasonable, but he drew both of his power overwhelming from his deck yep. in his hand. So he just had 12 damage that it's like unlikely to pair in that type of sequence. I think that would be the one that puts me on tilt, but hopefully that's not the case for Crumtastic. He still has uh, one more chance. He has to defeat this Druid deck from Chalky three times, which is probably one of the tallest orders you can ask for in any deck in the current metagame. Yeah, I think the um, the power of Druid, and we see it as one of the most common classes overall in tournaments, is that it's just consistent. And when you say, you know, you've got to win one out of three matchups as Druid, like, yeah. you're, you're normally feeling pretty good. You're normally going to draw into that ramp at some point. And this is really interesting, though, because as we go into Mulligans, we see Lepinome, oh, Druid wait. of the Saber. So this might be a little bit more of an aggressive matchup again. And uh, we've seen that Chaki, you know, knows his stuff in, in these sort of aggro matchups. And I think one of the key ones is he knows when to trade and when he knows he can't trade and just commit to try, uh, try and end the game. This is a really strong start for Chalky with a very unusual list here. I'm actually really excited to see how this plays out because if you're Crumtastic, leaning on this Hunter deck for the third time, he does have a really strong opening hand, but I would be really, really worried about being able to overcome this deck three times. And as he starts to see what's gonna come out of his opponent, there are some real threats here against this Hunter deck. Yeah, so this Druid deck is very aggressive compared to its combo variant. I, I don't know what Druids really classify it these days. It's probably a mid-range deck still. Yeah. However, ultimately, it's also a combo deck that you want to gather towards. 
Uh, but the key to that is to this deck is to be able to curve much more aggressively. And you also cut a lot of the top end. Sometimes you don't even run cards like Ancient of Lore and whatnot, you, or even Dr. Boom. It depends on what you really want in the ends. Uh, but the big ones that you really want to get are like Fell Reavers, right? Yeah. Turn five. Uh, everything else after that is debatable. Yeah, Besides exactly. Force of Nature. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's also a good card, I think. Yeah. Um, but I think like uh, we might see a Dr. Boom in here because it's just like one of those cards that's like, yeah. still good. And again, something that this deck can do because it does play more aggressive is Savage Raw isn't necessarily something you just see on turn nine. Right, with combo. Mm -hmm. It's something where you can just come out with a Savage Raw or even double Savage Raw on a board with a few minions. And really interesting just to uh, wonder what Crumb's reaction would have been when he saw like turn one Living Roots. <laughs> yep, fairly standard. Yep. And then suddenly it's Druid of uh -oh. the Saber. And then you'll see Lepano, it's like not right. again. Yeah, exactly. The Druid of the Saber gives a lot of versatility cards like Savage Roar. It's not only latent damage that can sit here on the board and grow like a miniature shade, or it can also just do two damage plus the extra two from the Savage Roar. So it's, it's, very, it's a very flexible card. It's very nice to actually have as a druid. Yeah, Chalky's going to be able to build a board here that Crumtastic is going to have to keep track of and be aware of throughout the entirety of this game. He can't mm -hmm. just afford to try and push a lot of damage because he runs the risk at all times that if there's multiple bodies on the board, a Savage Roar top deck can be instant lethal out of nowhere. And that's something that, as a hunter, you don't really want to be left trying to deal with that or put in that position. Yeah, the good thing for Crumtastic, though, is we did see that explosive tra uh, explosive trap. So we know Chaki knows about this, but against the Druid, they do run a lot of low health minions in this aggressive deck. So explosive trap can actually get a lot of work done if you manage to get it on the board. And now that I see Chaki's lineup, I can see that he very clearly just wants to kill uh, the, the Secret Paladin with this list. I think Agri Druid's best facet is not only how good it is against at, at killing your opponent, but specifically against a metagame that has a lot of Druid, which is it's good against a lot of Secret Paladin. I anticipate that this is what Chalky's trying to target. Yeah, one of the uh, completely valid tactics for Conquest specifically, because you have to win with every one of your decks to take the set, you can just say, okay, I will not lose to one deck, right? That's super popular, so like Secret Paladin. Just be like, my lineup doesn't lose to Secret Paladin, so that's how I presume I'm going to move through the bracket and win all the sets. And it seems to be doing okay for Chucky so far versus Face Hunter as well, so not too bad. Yeah, it's not very typical to see a Face Hunter matchup where the Hunter player is on lower health and being forced to trade. This is absolutely very standard for Chalky. He doesn't necessarily play strictly aggressive archetypes, but he does like to be in that sort of commanding position where he is going to try and dictate the pace of the game to his opponent. Yeah, and this feels really awkward for Crumtastic as well, because he wants to like pop that scientist and get the secret on board. But if it's explosive, then he's just removed the two health minion off the board whilst putting explosive there as well. So now this Raptor could just proc a potential explosive trap on its own, which you, know, you kind of want to catch a few more minions there. Well, one of the most important cards has been drawn for Chalky, and let me tell you, it's one of the most explosive cards out there. Every time I see Fell Reaver, it just gets me really excited because I see this card being the reason you win and the reason you lose, like, at the same <laughs> time. Like, okay, like, sometimes it's great, but against other times, if you can keep it isolated, say you do have Freezing Trap, you can't do anything and it becomes a liability. Yeah, and also in certain matchups, there's a real fear. So in matchups that can actually cycle a lot of cards in one turn, like Rogue or, say, Patron Warrior, you play that card and then they do something like, yeah, quick weapon, whirlwind, whirlwind, in a rage, and then execute at the end. So you burnt loads of your cards and it's dealt with in one turn. But Hunter, unless it's, say, a Hunter's Mark, doesn't really have the option of doing that a lot of the time. It's normally much more difficult to deal with it. Yeah. No, in this match, I don't think there's realistically a way for Crumtastic to remove this Fell Reaver. His best hope at this point is basically that that bear trap buys him one additional turn. But that Fell Reaver on the board represents a threat that's going to end the game for him over the course of the next three turns. Yeah, and what could have been interesting is the play of you leave two minions up, so you leave the Fell Reaver and one of the others, hope the other one attacks first, so then it ha then the Fell Reaver runs into the bear, but Chaki being pretty good at the game and also having knowledge of bear trap in the deck will definitely play around that. So you might have to just, from Tassic, might have to just go away from that strategy potentially and just uh, try and do what he can versus this Fell Reaver. It does hurt though for Chalky to see one of his two Savage Roars burned right off the top there off that Fell Reaver discard. That does mean that his ultimate win condition has changed a little bit here. I think what hurts the most is seeing the second Savage Roar, or see, just seeing anything that you really wanted at the time happening that way, but uh, I think it'll be okay. And, and Pilot Strider here is a pretty good pickup. However, I think Chalky's going to attack first. 
recognize that bear trap is a possibility, and most likely end up swiping, even though he wants to usually develop a minion. Yeah, I think with a Fel Reaver on board, he, he's probably in the mindset of, you know what, I'm just going to win the game with this Fel Reaver. Yep. So as long as this can just keep hitting face, the Hunter can't. The Hunter's going to die pretty quick. Probably quicker than the Hunter can respond, because as you said earlier, Kevin, the, the Druid's actually, you know, easily in the health advantage here. Right. right, and he doesn't have the ability, realistically, to clear that Fel Reaver off. If he leaves the beast up, there is the possibility that the kill command and the minion represent enough damage to remove the Fel Reaver, which at this point is basically how Chalky is going to stay in this game. Yeah, so as you see, all the cards getting burned from Chalky there, but Druid of the Claw. Wow. That's a really important draw as well, to really shut off the ability for the Hunter to flip the switch and kill the Druid, because that's a pretty aggressive board. You have eight with 10 guarantee on the hero power. It's not impossible for them to generate a little bit more uh, from a card in their hand. So hmm. it's one of those things where if I were to be a Chalky's position, I still wouldn't mind getting a little bit more mileage and play this in a defense, uh, or sorry, in taunt. <laughs> In a, in a top <laughs> mode, that's right. Yeah, um, exactly. So the Druid of the Claw, um, you, you, the line of plays where you'd play it in, in Taunt, you can still hero power to gain extra health. Mm -hmm. And then again, you just rely on the Fell Weaver hits this turn to face, and then hits next turn to face. And that's just game, because again, Hunter isn't really a deck you normally see a lot of healing in. Right, and Chalky also has to now be thinking with the number of discards that have happened off this Fell Reaver about the sincere risk that he is going to be pushed into fatigue. So he doesn't really want to take the risk of not having something to protect himself because he's not going to be able to just sustain this indefinitely. Where shall I strike? One thing he does know is that he's out of force of nature, so if, say in the very worst case scenario, his entire board was cleared, which it won't be. In fact, this game has already been decided based off that draw. But uh, one thing to consider is that yeah, this is all the cards he might have left. So he's got to he's got to make it work the best he can. Well, so that's why right. he takes a long time to evaluate, and that's why he's won 3-0. Chalky takes his series on stream in a very convincing fashion. Yeah, and it's re really interesting set overall. And even for Comtastic, like locking in that hunter every single match might have been seen as, well, you know, he's not doing so well with it, maybe he should flick to another deck. But what he's actually doing is something you alluded to earlier, where he's, he's just uh, hiding information, because he does go down into the low bracket, so it's not like he's out of the tournament straight away. So he hides that information, so his other two decks are actually secret a little bit, and, uh, and can just, you know, well, he had to win with the Hunter at some point, right? So there's no real reason to not lock it in. And I mean, strategically going up against a player like Chalky, I think you choose to run something that's aggressive in your lineup. You choose to play what might be arguably your weakest deck, and try to get the win with it out of the way early so that you can then rely on something that's got a little more power as you're starting to force yourself to deal with things like the Druid deck, which ultimately wasn't at all what we expected. We didn't see the classical mid-range that coin flips with everything in the meta. We saw just that really raw, aggressive play out of Chalky, which is really impressive. I think on the other end, if you're doing crumptastic shoes, not all hope is lost. You're, you're still in the loser's bracket, or the, or the lower bracket, we call it. Um, and you do only have one of your decks revealed. I mean, you, there still is the idea that if you see the class lineups, you can interpret and extrapolate what they're probably playing. Uh, however, you did keep a lot of that tech hidden. And that information, uh, hidden information, is really powerful, as you mentioned, Raven. Yeah. So it's not the end of the world for uh, for Crumtastic. And it'd be quite a story if he would lose here now, climb all the way back, and still qualify for the VN. Yeah, and then overall for Chucky, you've got to be pretty happy with that pretty solid win and he played really well like yeah. he was just super solid and not that it's unexpected from a player of his caliber but definitely when we saw like in eu a lot of the uh, sort of big names go out relatively early definitely must just feel good to be like right next round and go and just keep going like that with a 3-0 victory as well did a little of you die inside when you're watching raven all your friends I drop like flies no i'm not gonna come in on that no, okay. <laughs> all right all right well it's, i just find it really funny because raven he follows the european scene so diligently he practices he's actually actually a, a strong player many times opting to cast instead of play um, or do both simultaneously but you know at the same time we welcome you to the desk in North America uh, so so Kevin uh, take what was some of your takeaways to wrap up the series before we head over to TJ for an interview I mean I think what we've seen today out of Chalky suggests that he's really trying to predict what's happening in this meta we've seen so much mid-range we know mm -hmm. already that uh, Zoo Warlock, Midrange Druid, Secret Paladin are probably going to be some of the core decks and the things we're going to see the most of over the course of the weekend. So to take a lineup that punishes those things and plays really aggressively, I think it's actually going to position him really well. He's probably in a really great spot to go quite a distance in this bracket. I would expect to see so. And I know one person who's a big fan, not only of Hearthstone, but also of Chalky, because he put him on my desktop monitor as a background. <laughs> 
It's TJ. He's waiting with Chalky for an interview. Thank you very much, Dan. And great cast on the day so far, guys. It's good to see some of the new faces uh, up there and doing well. Yeah, Chalky, uh, he's a good friend of mine. It's, it's good to see him uh, take the victory. And, uh, of course, a lot of people label him as an aggro player, so it was, it was kind of nice to see the aggro druid in combination uh, with some of the uh, other decks that he's built. But I'm actually standing by with an interview with Chalky. So, Chalky, can you hear me? I can. What's up, DJ? Hey, man. Uh, first off, a uh, big congratulations. Uh, I know you were a bit disappointed in your finish in, in 2015. So uh, how does it feel to start off your 2016 run uh, with a 3-0? Uh, it feels really great. Obviously, best result you can really hope for. Uh, games went smooth. I felt like I played really well, and my decks performed fine. All right, well, uh, talk to me a little bit more about your decks. Uh, what went into the, the preparation? Uh, did you practice with your team? Uh, did you have any uh, players that, that helped you prepare your decks or on ladder? Uh, all of the lists are kind of, you know, taken from different people, really. Like, I didn't come up with the list from scratch, but what I did was I made sure all of the lists were really capable of hitting, like, top 20 legends. So every deck I'm taking this tournament, I've hit top 20 legend with. And from there, I basically took the list, played against friends, my team. Uh, one person in particular that probably wants a shout-out is I played a lot with That's Admirable. Uh, he's doing pretty well in the bracket, too, right now. So we have similar stuff going on. But yeah, all these decks are proven. Uh, I made a little adjustments to each of them based off testing and feel really good about my chances. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, your your label as sort of an aggressive player. Um, you were known in the past for being aggressive decks, but at the beginning of Conquest, you, you came up with that new fatigue strategy. Uh, what do you think of the fact that people always label you as sort of an aggressive player with an aggressive personality? What do you think of that? Well, I'll tell you what I am, and it's a player that wants to win. So when I bring decks to a tournament, I play to win completely. If I think aggro is the best, I'll bring that. If I don't, I won't. Like, uh, I'm really known as a hunter player, but hunter I don't think is really great right now, so I don't have it in my lineup. Uh, I did find some aggro decks that really succeeded, and that's what I'm having the most success with right now. So that's what I'm using. All right. Well, uh, thanks for the interview, Chucky. I wish you the best of luck in uh, future rounds, and uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, down the line. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, and to give you guys a quick update on some of the other things that have been happening on some of the off-stream matches, uh, Kit Kats has defeated uh, the Rat from Team Splice uh, to go on to round three. So that's some uh, well-known players that have moved on. Uh, LBYS, uh, Vicious Syndicate, and Nossum of Grand National Champions have also moved on to round three. Those are two players that, uh, if you play a lot of Opens in North America, you know their names. And of course, uh, as Chalky mentioned, that's admirable. One of his practice partners uh, has also moved on to round number two. Uh, so those are uh, all players to watch. Uh, one thing to note, we'll have an update a little bit later on as well. Tides of Time versus Strife Crow is a match that's happening off stream uh, at the moment. So uh, hopefully during the next break, we can uh, have a little bit of update on that match. Uh, but that should be a, a, a pretty good one uh, to look out for. Uh, make sure throughout the day you guys are staying engaged on social media. Uh, you can use the hashtag HCT or tweet at Play Hearthstone, or of course any one of the cashers' personal Twitters. Um, we will be featuring some of the tweets on stream. So if you want to, you know, see your tweet on stream, make sure you're staying engaged. Also, you can head over to Facebook.com slash Hearthstone uh, if you prefer that. Uh, but we are going to go to a quick break before we jump into match number three of the day. But don't go anywhere, guys. More Hearthstone Championship Tour action for the Americas continues right after this.